Hey everybody, welcome back. This is chapter two. We're starting the metric system. I break up this chapter into two presentations because quite honestly, it's a pretty big chapter. It's all math. So it's better to break it up, give you a little break. And then in class, we also break it up into two weeks. So the first week, we're gonna talk about the metric system and we're gonna talk about percentages. The second week, we're going to also talk about, you know, a little bit of a recap of the metric system, along with some other concepts like density and volume that will also reach back into our knowledge of the metric system and some of the things that we're doing this current week. So without further ado, let's just jump right on in. Now, you've all probably seen the metric system somewhere, right? And you're also familiar with our system, the English system, which is also called the imperial system. We use the English system here in the U.S., but most other people use the metric system. The French organized a committee to devise a universal measuring system, and they came up with the metric system. It's really simple. There's a single base unit for each measurement, like the measurements we talked about for the prerequisite science skills, length, mass, um, volume, those kinds of things. So this table shows you the physical quantity. We've got length, mass, volume, and time. And the basic unit, the meter, gram, liter, and second. And then, of course, their symbol. Now, I'm sure that you've seen all of these, especially if you've had a chemistry class or two. Originally, the meter was defined as a physical distance, and it was a part, a very small part, of the distance from the North Pole to the equator. A kilogram was equal to the mass of a cube of water that measured 0.1 meters on each side, and a liter was set to the volume of one kilogram of water at four degrees Celsius. So all of these definitions had a physical distance or a physical volume tied to it. Here's a table that you will probably want to put in your notebook. It has all of the metric prefixes that we'll be interested in. For class, I will mainly focus on these because these are the ones that you will likely see when it comes to chemistry. However, on your homework, any of these on this table are fair game. And just because I said I'll focus on them doesn't mean that I can't throw something else at you. Now don't worry, for the exam, you will have access to this table. But the table won't do a whole lot for you if you don't know how to use it. Let's talk about the table. The first column tells you the prefix. Now I told you that each of these has a basic unit, the meter, gram, liter, and second. The prefix goes in front of that basic unit and it's like a multiplier. So if you have a kilogram, you're looking at what a kilo is, which is a thousand or one times 10 to the third. So you're saying 1000 times the gram. Okay, with the prefix that's smaller, so let's say something like milli, that's saying 0 0.001 times a gram. So that's how the prefixes work. They're like multipliers. You can make a gram or a basic unit bigger or smaller depending on the prefix. There's the symbol that you're gonna use when you're writing you know, problems and doing math. You're gonna write that symbol in front of the basic unit. So if I were gonna write kilogram, it would be kg because kilo is abbreviated k. Milligram would be little m with a g because milli is a lowercase m. You'll also see scientific notation.
in my opinion, that is the easiest way to write these numbers, especially when we start doing problems. But it's totally up to you. If you like to see the regular numbers or the decimals or the fraction, whatever works for you, that's what you use. When we're doing problems with these metric prefixes, I will primarily use scientific notation. I think it's good practice. And also, again, to my mind, it is easier. But if it's not easier to you, don't be afraid to speak up in class or to come to office hours and ask for help using a different method because I can teach that way too. So this kind of summarizes some of the things I was saying on the previous slide about the abbreviations and the prefixes. So kilometer is abbreviated KM, so on and so forth. I do want to point out micro. Micro, this looks like a little M, but it's actually a Greek symbol from mu. So that is different. It's got a little tail. And then you can put your basic unit like liter, for example. In medicine, micro is also equal to MC, just so that there's no confusion. So for a microliter, you can see the micro, the mu sign, or MCL. In this class, we're going to stick with the, the mu sign. So just make sure that you take note. And when you're doing your homework, chapter check-in, use the mu, not a little m. Those two are very different. So there are advantages to using the metric system. The prefixes enlarge or reduce the base units, so it just makes the math really easy. If you're in the kitchen and you're trying to bake something, let's say you're making, not even baking, let's say you're just making some pancakes, right? And you're trying to scale up your recipe because your recipe, you know, you can maybe feed like a couple people. But let's imagine we're in a post-coronavirus world and you're having a bunch of folks over. Well, now that recipe needs to feed 10 people, not two. So when you're doing all your multiplying, you're like, okay, what does eight tablespoons equal? And so then you're like, okay, well, that means this many cups. And no, you don't have to think about that with a metric system. The prefixes do all the thinking for you. So that is a huge advantage of using the metric system, even when you cook or when you bake. So to do conversions within the metric system, we use what's called a unit equation. And that's the first part of, you know, kind of the, the skill base that we're building for doing problems, conversion problems. The unit equation is going to relate two quantities that are equal. Two examples are one kilometer is equal to a thousand meters, right? So that you can literally read off of the chart. But these two are equal. You can also say one centimeter is equal to one one hundredth of a meter. You can write that as a decimal. The other way you can write this is 100 centimeters is equal to one meter. All of these are just taking the same measurement and writing it two different ways. We're going to practice that. I'll do a couple of examples for you, but we will do a lot of practice with writing unit equations in class. So if it's still kind of fuzzy to you after watching the video, that's all right. And I'm expecting that. The best way to learn this is to practice and to get feedback on how you're doing. So again, don't worry if after watching this lecture, you're still like, mm, I don't know if I could do a problem right now. That's okay. I just want you to be familiar with it. I want you to have heard these terms before so we can hit the ground running when we cover this section. Here we go. We're gonna write a unit equation that relates grams and nanograms. 
grams, well, that's one of our basic units here, okay? Nanograms, that's a prefix that will reduce the size of a gram. So if I had one gram, I go down on my chart, I find nano, I put a little star by it, and I read what it says. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't want to write all those zeros. So this is, again, why I like to use scientific notation. But the chart says that I have 1 times 10 to the negative 9. Well, that doesn't. 1 times 10 to the negative 9 nanograms. That's not exactly right if you just read it off the chart. One gram should be bigger than a nanogram, so we actually have to flip the sign to say one gram is equal to one times ten to the positive nine nanograms. Now one way that I can show you to keep this all together is by comparing which one is the bigger unit. We've got grams and nanograms, which means we're going from a big unit to a small unit. Whenever you're doing that, the exponent is positive, okay? So we're taking one gram and going to nanograms grams are bigger than nanograms so when you're writing how many nanograms are in a gram the exponent in the scientific notation should be positive let's do that again we've got kilometers and meters kilometers are up above meters so let me change colors here So a kilometer is big, the meter is small, and this is all relative. If I have one kilometer, then that means I have one times 10 to the third meters. Notice that we have a positive exponent here. But what if I wanted to do it the other way? What if I wanted to go from, let's say, nanograms to grams? Nanograms are smaller. So if I start with one nanogram, I'm going to have a very small number for grams. When you're going from a smaller unit to a bigger unit, your exponent is negative. Now we'll do that with the kilometers and the meters. If I had one meter, that's smaller than a kilometer. My exponent has to be negative. Don't feel bad if you're like, nope, still don't get it. That's okay. We're going to practice this. It's one of those things that it's hard to get just by watching. You have to do some examples and ask some questions, get some feedback, and then you'll get it. I promise. The second thing you'll need to know is how to write unit factors. 
So we've got unit equations that relate to equal quantities. And from that unit equation, we can write a unit factor or a conversion factor, which is just a ratio. You're taking the unit equation and writing it as two fractions, essentially. So if we have one meter is equal to 100 centimeters, you literally take this equal sign, make it a division sign, so that slash or the, the line, and that's a unit factor. Okay, unit factors look like fractions. If I were to say take from our last one, one nanogram is equal to one times 10 to the minus nine grams, we can do that too. You write the one nanogram over one times 10 to the minus nine grams. And then the other one, because you can always write two unit factors per unit equation, you just flip it and write the reciprocal. Now let's do some practice. Writing unit factors is pretty simple, so I would recommend pausing the video here and writing out the two unit factors that you can get from each of these unit equations. If you don't want to do that, that's fine too. You can just keep on watching and I'll write it out for you. Unit factors look like fractions. So we'll take one microliter. Remember that little tail, that means micro. Over one times 10 to the six liters. Then you write the reciprocal, which is just flipping it. You write the liters on top and microliter on the bottom. For the second one, we've got one gram. We'll write that on top. 1,000 milligrams on the bottom. Then you flip it and write the reciprocal. 1,000 milligrams on top, one gram on the bottom. We can use the unit equations and the unit factors to convert from one metric unit to another. You might see this called unit analysis method, dimensional analysis, or factor label method. Those are all three different ways to say the same exact thing. Now I'll show you some examples of how we go through a problem and we go from writing a unit equation to the unit factors and choosing the correct unit factor to convert the units we have to the units we want. I'm also going to show you the way that I like to solve word problems. Now these problems are going to start pretty simple, but I encourage you to get the method down. Even if you don't use my method, have a method for solving word problems. Something that includes rewriting the question, rewriting what you know or what you're given, and then any information you know like um, equations, um, writing down unit equations, unit factors, those kinds of things. Always have a plan of how to get from point A to point B. So gather all your resources. Then you can write out your equation, then touch your calculator and put in the numbers. So there's a lot of planning that happens before you even touch your calculator. I'll show you what I mean. What is the mass in grams of a 325 milligram aspirin tablet? Now you may have a little bit of a headache right now if math is not your thing, I apologize. But you might be reaching for some aspirin right about now. I hope not though. I always rewrite the question. We have 325 milligrams, and we want to know how many grams that is. Okay, that's our question. 
to get there, we need a unit equation. We need to relate milligrams to grams. Now you can use the chart. I've been doing this for quite some time. So I know a lot of these just they're ingrained in my in my brain. But don't feel bad because you have to look it up. You should. You haven't been doing this for a very long time. Now I know how milligrams and grams are related. If I have one milligram, that's the same thing as saying one times 10 to the minus three grams because milli reduces that size of the gram. So it's small to big, okay? And I'm gonna show you how to do this two ways. That's why I'm leaving half of the half of the slide here blank. We're gonna go through and do it this way and then I'll show you another way to do it. Now that we've got our unit equation, we need unit factors. That's taking our unit equation and writing it as two fractions or ratios. One milligram on top, one times 10 to the third grams on the bottom, or we can have the grams on top, milligram on the bottom. Now we set up our actual equation. We've got 325 milligrams. We need to choose a unit factor that's going to convert our milligrams to grams. In order to convert from milligrams to grams, we need to cancel out the milligram unit. When you have one unit on the top and one on the bottom, you can cancel. And that's why we're using the second unit factor. We've got milligrams on top, milligrams on the bottom. So they cancel out and we're left with grams. That's called unit or dimensional analysis. That's what we just did. Once you make sure that your units cancel the way that you expect them to, and you double check to make sure the unit you have left is the one that you want, which we look at the question, yes, we're looking for grams. Now you can go through and do your math. I would encourage you to practice putting this into your calculator using scientific notation, just as practice. When you do that, you'll get 0.325 grams. Now double check and make sure that makes sense. Milligram is smaller than gram, right? So you should get a number that is smaller than the one you started with. You're not gonna have 3,000 grams from 300 milligrams. That doesn't make sense. So always double check, make sure your answer makes sense, okay? So that's way number one. But let's say that you write your unit equation a little bit differently. We've still got the same question But instead, what if we said one gram is equal to 1,000 milligrams? That's true. This is a unit equation. We can still get to the same answer. Let's write our unit factors. One gram over 1,000 milligrams or 1,000 milligrams over one gram. Those are our unit factors. 
the factors look like fractions. Now let's write our equation. We're starting with 325 milligrams. And we still need to choose which unit factor to use. We still want the one with milligrams on the bottom. We need to cancel those milligrams. Milligrams on the top, milligrams on the bottom. We're left with grams. Check. But this time, when you're putting it into your calculator, instead of using scientific notation, you're taking 325 and dividing it by 1,000, which is the same answer. So whichever way you write the unit equation, you should still come up with the same answer, okay? These two say the same thing. They're just written a little bit differently. So I wanted to show you that just in case your brain works a little bit differently from mine. But for the most part, I'll be showing you this way, okay? That's just how my brain works. With that said, here's the official slide on how to do the unit analysis method. I already went through it and showed you what it is, and I think that's more valuable before you actually get the text on how to do it. If this is your jam, if you like to read the steps and follow them, here you go. This is for you. I, however, learn by watching someone do it and then trying it myself. So I'm trying to accommodate everyone because all of y'all are not me. And that's a good thing. We need some diversity, right? So when you're using this method, what's, what they encourage you to do in the textbook is to write down the unit asked for in the, in the answer. That's the same thing as saying reword or rewrite the question. Then, you're going to write down the given value related to the answer. So in our last example, we were given 325 milligrams, right? So you write down the information that is given to you. You also want to write down your unit equation here. So you can relate the two, what you're given and what you're asked for. Once you've got all that information together, you write out your equation, you put in your numbers, put it into your calculator, and there you go. Now the example that we did before was just a metric conversion problem. We had one unit, we converted it to another, and that was it. There are metric metric conversion problems where you're going from one unit to another and then from that unit to your final unit. What is the volume in liters of a 65 deciliter blood sample? Now if you're interested in the health sciences, you'll know, or you'll at least be introduced to at some point, the fact that deciliters are used to describe the volume of blood. Okay. Our question, we've got 65 deciliters, and we want to know what is that volume in liters? Use the chart, and you can figure out which one's bigger, deciliter or liter? Deciliters are small, liters are bigger. 
we can go directly from a deciliter to a liter. Why? Because there's the liter here, and we're just trying to get to the base unit, the basic unit. So we're good to go. When you look at that chart, you will see if I have one deciliter, then I have a tenth of a liter. So that's 0 0.1. That's my unit equation. When I write this as a fraction, those are my unit factors. Then I have to set up the problem. I'm starting with 65 deciliters. I need to have a unit factor that has deciliters in the bottom to cancel it. I make sure that my units cancel, and they do. Now all I've got to do is the multiplication. 65 deciliters is the same as 6.5 liters. Now I'll do it again just to show the different way with the different unit equation. It's the same thing. We're writing it the same way. It's just that the unit equation looks a little bit different. If I have one liter, then that means I have 10 deciliters. I write out my fractions those are the unit factors and I set up my equation still need the one with deciliters in the bottom because we have to cancel We're left with liters, which is good. 65 divided by 10 gives you 6.5 liters. Same thing. And notice, the liters are in the top and the deciliters are in the bottom. It doesn't matter which unit equation you write, whether you write it in reference to deciliters or liters. You still get the same answer. Now let's do those two metric metric pet, uh, uh, conversions that are a little bit peskier, okay? I alluded to that earlier, that we can do the single ones, but we can also build on top of that. A hospital has 125 deciliters of blood plasma. What is the volume in milliliters? Uh-oh. Here's our given. and we're trying to figure out what that means in milliliters. Notice how each of the units that we're given has a prefix. We can't just go from deciliters to milliliters. We've got to use a go-between. We're going to convert our deciliters to liters and then we can go from liters to milliliters. So the two metric metric conversions, it's like doing two single metric metric conversions, okay? So our first problem 
is going to be deciliters to liters. And then our second problem is going to be taking those liters and converting to milliliters. And we're going to do it all in one equation, but I want to set up the unit equation and unit factors for each. Then we'll bring it all together in the equation. Now we just worked with deciliters on the other page, right, for the other slide. One deciliter is the same thing as 0 0.1 liters. That's the unit equation. And then we write our unit factors. So that's for that. Now we've got to worry about getting from liters to milliliters. Liters are bigger than milliliters. So if I have one liter and I use my chart, I have to have a positive exponent here. I should say small, not milliliters. Big to small. Positive exponent. Okay. That's the unit equation we're going to work with. Then we write our unit factors. Now we can actually put all this together. Starting with 125 deciliters, we're going to have two unit factors before we get to our desired answer. The first one needs to take us from deciliters to liters. That means we need deciliters in the bottom to cancel. For our next unit factor, we need to get rid of the liters. So that means since our, we left off in our equation with liters at the top, so that means our next unit factor has to have liters at the bottom to get rid of it and be left with milliliters. All right, so we've canceled out our liters. The next step should get us to milliliters. We've got liters on the top and liters on the bottom. That cancels. We're left with milliliters. Now you just have to do the math. When you're putting this into your calculator, remember that these unit factors are fractions. And if there's a number on the bottom other than 1, you have to divide. In this case, we don't have that. We've got 125. You're going to multiply by 0 0.1, divide by 1, then multiply by 1 times 10 to the third, which is 1,000, and then divide by 1. But dividing by 1 isn't going to change the answer, right? When you do all that math,
you get a lot of milliliters. But let's say we wanted to write this in scientific notation. Why not, right? We can. We write our coefficient, which is at least 1, but less than 10. And if we put our decimal here, we need to get all the way back to the end. One, two, three, four. So that's a two metric metric conversion. We started with one unit that had a prefix and we need to get to another unit that had a prefix. That's when you know you have a two metric metric conversion on your hands. We will do more of these problems in class, so don't worry. I'll give you one more example of a two metric metric conversion before we move on. This time, we're looking at the mass of the moon. The moon is about 7.35 times 10 to the 22nd kilograms, which in my brain, that's just inconceivable. I don't even know what that means, okay? What is the mass expressed in nanograms? Again, we've got two different prefixes. So we have to do two metric metric conversions. Our question, we're taking the mass of the moon in kilograms and figuring out what ridiculously large number of nanograms that would be. We can't go directly from kilograms to nanograms. We need to use grams as a go-between. So we're gonna have two unit equations and two sets of unit factors before we can set up that final equation to get us from kilograms to nanograms. First, we're going from kilograms to grams. Kilograms are big, grams are small. This is always relative. So that means we're going to have a positive exponent when we're writing out that scientific notation. One kilogram is one times 10 to the third grams. That's our unit equation. We write those fractions. And those are our unit factors. For the second part, we're going from grams to nanograms. Grams are bigger, so we're going from big to small again. If I have one gram, you have to use your chart here. Then I have 1 times 10 to the ninth nanograms. That's my unit equation. I write out my fractions. And those are my unit factors. Now I usually get asked, do I have to write out both of the unit factors? Do I have to write out the unit equation? The answer is you should. And the reason is you, you don't want to get too full of yourself and think, oh, I'm just going to write out the equation. Because it's very easy to write a unit factor upside down. It's very easy to think that you know how to convert from grams to nanograms and you write the wrong thing. Writing out each of these steps gives you more opportunities to catch those little mistakes that can cause you points at the end. If you choose not to, that's on you. When you do a chapter check-in for me, 
You need to show me your work. I will take points off if you do not show me your work. So in that case, you do have to. Well, you don't have to. You just won't get as many points, right? But it's just recommended that you do because good bookkeeping will help you tremendously in this course. Okay, off the soapbox. Back to math. Now we're going to set up the equation. This is our given. 7.35 times 10 to the 22nd kilograms. Let's worry about how we get from kilograms to grams for this first unit factor. That means we need to have kilograms in the bottom so that it cancels. The next part of the equation takes us from grams to nanograms. So we want grams on the bottom and nanograms on the top. Now we go through and make sure that our units cancel the way we expect them to. With our little plan, we know that we should get to grams first, and we do. And then we cancel out the grams and get to nanograms. Now that that's done, we can do the math. So know how to put in scientific notation into your calculator. If you don't know how to do that, then you will have a very difficult time putting in this number 7.35 times 10 to the 22nd because you have to put in all the right number of zeros. Okay. Now, once you do that, you should get this answer. Seven point three five times ten to the thirty four nanograms. Always include your units. If you don't include units, then it's not correct. I don't know what that number means. So include your units, please. Now kind of a spin off of the metric metric conversions is compound units. All right, we can do calculations with compound units. Some measurements have a ratio of units. And an example of that that we all know is the speed limit. In the US, it's miles per hour. Pretty much everywhere else, it's kilometers per hour. Okay. When you see that, it's the number of miles for every hour. Okay. So that is a compound unit. Let's do a compound unit problem. This is where we're trying to take one unit, like kilometers per hour, and convert it to meters per second. So we're converting the kilometers to meters and the hours to seconds, right? We do the same exact method. Our question, I rewrote it, 105 kilometers per hour to, well, I don't know how many meters per second. We're going to have two different unit equations, but this time we're not kind of going doing the go-between like we did for the metric metric conversion. It's just that we simply have two different units that we need to convert. We'll deal with kilometers to meters first. If I have one kilometer, well, that's bigger 
than a meter. So that means my exponent will be positive. One kilometer is equal to one times 10 to the third meters. There's my unit equation. Here are my unit factors, which look like fractions. Now the second part, you will need to take note because you will absolutely see something like this on an exam or even a chapter check-in, hint, hint. We need to go from hours to seconds. Now this is something that we can think through because time is something we've been dealing with all our lives, right? If I have one hour, then that means that I have 60 minutes. And in each one of those minutes, I have 60 seconds. So if I want to go from hours to seconds, I have to work through two, I have to work through minutes, right? So my unit factors for this top one are one hour over 60 minutes and 60 minutes over one hour. And for the bottom unit equation, we've got one minute for every 60 seconds. And then we write the reciprocal. Now we're finally set up to put an equation together. We're starting with 105 kilometers per hour. Notice that kilometers are in the top, hours are in the bottom. The first thing we'll deal with is converting from kilometers to meters. Kilometers are in the top. To cancel that out, we have to have a unit factor with kilometers in the bottom. Okay, that part's done. Now we've got to worry about the hours. The hours are in the bottom. To cancel out the hours, we need to use the unit factor with hours in the top. So we go on over So we need to use one hour over 60 minutes. But we're not done yet. Right now we've got it in minutes, and that's great and all, but the question is asking for seconds. To cancel out the minutes and be left with seconds on the bottom, We need minutes on the top. When we go through and cancel, we're looking to get meters here, which we did. And then that meter stays there. It carries all the way through. The hours, we cancel, and we're left with minutes. Then we use another unit factor to get rid of the minutes, and we're left with seconds on the bottom. Once you've double checked that, you can do your math, but be careful here. You're multiplying and dividing. 
So you're multiplying 105 times 1 times 10 to the third, that's 1,000. Then you're dividing by 60 and dividing by 60 again. You can't forget that division there. If you do, you'll get the wrong answer. Now we've got a little bit of a conundrum. Your calculator will tell you 29.166 repeating. Okay, That's what that bar above the 6 means. It's repeating forever. We can't write that as our answer because we learned about significant figures. For this problem, we have to look at our given information. The given information in the problem is 105 kilometers per hour. That's three sig figs. Our answer, in turn, also has to have three sig figs. Here's the first sig fig, the second sig fig, and that one is the third one. So we're going to look at the six to determine if we round up or stay the same. Six is definitely five or greater, so we're going to round that one up to a two. That's our final answer. 29.2 meters per second. You will see a problem like this. Make sure that you understand how to convert from hours to seconds and you know how to do it in the context of a compound unit problem. The final concept that we're going to cover in this section is the percent concept. We're familiar with percentages because that's how we've been graded all our lives in school. So if you get an 85% as a grade, that means that you got 85% of the work right, 85 out of 100 points. So a percent expresses the amount of a single quantity compared to the entire sample. It's also a ratio of parts per 100 parts. And that's very important. I'll tell you why in just a second. So the equation that you see below is how you can calculate a percent. One quantity over the total sample times 100%. What you may have also seen is part over whole times 100%. They're the same thing. Let's do a sample problem. Bronze is an alloy of copper and tin. That means it's a combination of these two metals. If a sample of bronze contains 79.2 grams of copper and 10.8 grams of tin, what is the percent of copper in bronze? Before we do anything, before you touch that calculator, figure out what the question is. And what we need to know is the percentage of copper. Since we're dealing with percentages, we should write out whatever equations we know that relate to percentages. I'm going to use the part over the whole. It's easier to write. Now we were given some information in this problem too. We were given the parts and the whole. So the whole is bronze, which is the sum of the copper plus the tin. That's our whole. We know that there's 79.2 grams of copper and 10.8 grams of tin. The copper is a part. The tin is a part. We're interested 
in the copper. So let's write a little bit more of a specific equation. Percent copper, which its element symbol is Cu, is equal to the number of grams of copper that we have over the total number of grams of bronze. And we multiply that by 100%. Now we can fill in some numbers. The amount of copper, we were told, 79.2 grams. The bronze, we were told, but we have to do a little bit of math to figure that out. We have to add together the 79.2 plus the 10.8. Now you can touch your calculator. If you touched it before now, you're in trouble. When you add 79.2 plus 10.8, you get 90 grams. So that is our whole. Now we can figure out that percentage by doing 79.2 divided by 90 and multiplying by 100. Don't forget the multiplying by 100 because it won't be a percentage. It'll be a decimal. Make sure that we have the right number of sig figs here because both of the numbers we got from our problem have three sig figs. So we're carrying out those three sig figs the whole way. You should get 88% copper. Make sure that makes sense. So 79.2 grams out of 90 grams. Well, that means that you've got mostly copper. So you should definitely have more than 50% copper. Okay, it is not equal. And that's what our answer says. Always do that mental math check. Does my answer make sense with what I know? Sometimes you put something wrong in on the calculator or you wrote the equation wrong. Maybe you flipped it and you did 90 divided by 79.2. In your mind, you should say, oh, I shouldn't get something over 100 because that's not how percents work to figure out how much this part is. Part out of a whole should always be less than 100%. Right. So use your brain. Don't let the calculator lull you into that sense of security. So the reason why I like to do percentages along with the metric metric conversions is because percents can be used as unit factors. Okay. Expressing the percentage as a part out of 100 parts. That looks a lot like a fraction. So 25% can be expressed as 25 out of 100, 10%, 10, 10 out of 100. Looks awfully close to a unit factor, and that's because it is. Let's say that we're told a rock is composed of 4.7% iron. Well, that means that if you have a rock sample 4.7 grams of iron will be in that 100 grams of sample, right? Your rock. Let's do a problem like that. The Earth and the Moon have a similar composition. Each one of them contains 4.7% iron. Doesn't that number look suspiciously familiar? Yes, it does. What is the mass of iron in a lunar sample that weighs 92 grams? Remember, lunar means moon. First thing we do, write out our question. We're looking for the mass 
of iron in 92 gram rock sample. That's our question. What do we know? Well, we've got a 92 gram lunar sample. And we're going to label that as our hole. We've got 4.70% iron, which is the same thing as 4.70 grams of iron out of 100 grams of sample. We can also write the reciprocal. I could flip that upside down and say 100 grams of sample over 4.7 grams of iron if I were doing an equation where I needed to do that. So just keep that in the back of your minds, okay? We can use these just like we use unit factors and we can flip them if we need to. That will come into play in the second part of chapter two, which hopefully you will watch. Back to our currently scheduled programming. 4.7 grams of iron over 100 grams of sample. I've got 92 grams of sample. I can multiply 4.70 grams of iron over 100 grams of sample. Now watch the units. Grams of sample cancels, grams of sample cancels. Our units are grams of iron. That's what we're looking for. Just because the units cancel doesn't mean that the numbers do. When you put this into your calculator, you're multiplying 92 times 4.7 and dividing by 100. If you don't divide by 100, then your number will be far too large. Your calculator will tell you 4.324, okay? That's the calculator answer. But we know better than that. We know significant figures. We've got a percentage in our problem, and we've got a mass. The percentage has three sig figs. The measurement of the mass of that lunar sample has two sig figs. We have to go with the fewest number of sig figs. That means that our answer must have two sig figs. It also needs some units. We'll get there. The four is the first sig fig. The three is the second one. Now we're going to look at that two to determine if we're going to round up or stay the same. 2 is less than 5, so we're just going to drop off the 2 and everything after it. And then our units, grams of iron. So there you have it. That's percentage as a unit factor. We will do calculations like this in class, so don't worry. We'll be doing a lot of practice problems in class. It's not going to be very lecture heavy. So make sure that you have a calculator, a notebook, or some kind of piece of paper or something to write down what you're doing. Because these sample problems that we do in class will absolutely help you with doing your homework. So thanks for watching. Make sure that you tune into the live lecture for those practice problems and any details regarding assignments and exams that are coming up.